Our next concept that we've mentioned a little bit earlier in a little bit of an overview is called spanning tree protocol. So what's spanning tree protocol? Well, in our network, we may have different bridges or different, uh, we may have different devices which connect se network segments. So we may have multiple segments of our network that we have these devices that connect these different segments together. And these different devices or our different bridges may also connect to each other and connect in multiple different ways in order to provide reliability as well as provide quick connections. Now this is good because when we have, we have an example of a uh, mesh topology over here where all of our devices are connected to, or all of our bridges are connected to all of the other bridges on our network, which in a way is good because if this bridge goes down, then all of our other bridges can still communicate with each other. Or if this bridge needed to communicate with this bridge over here, it doesn't have to go all the way around the world in order to get there. But well, what's their downside to this? Why do we need spanning tree protocol? Well, our downside is if our bridges form any loops, then we may have situations where our network goes down because of broadcast packets. So what do we mean by that? Let's take a look at our network here. Let's imagine that our let's imagine that all of our different computer nodes are on the same network and our bridges are just connecting our different parts of our network. And let's imagine that our server here sends out a broadcast packet. That broadcast packet is essentially a packet that goes out to everyone and says, hey, pass this along to everybody. Everybody needs to hear this. So our server here sends out a broadcast packet. Now, that broadcast packet is going to go to our first bridge here. Who's, this gonna, who's then going to say, oh, this is a broadcast packet. So I need to send this. So we have bridge A, B, C, D, and E. Bridge A sends the packet to bridge C, or bridge B, sorry, and also to bridge C. So it sends it to both of them. And then bridge C and bridge B say, okay, I'm not going to, this is a broadcast packet. I'm not going to send it back to the person who sent it to me, but I'm going to pass it along to everyone else I'm connected to. So, well, actually, bridge A is connected to everybody, so it's going to send it to everybody. So bridge A sends the packet to everybody. Now each of those bridges have a broadcast packet. They're not going to send it back to the link they got it from, but they're going to send it back to all their other links. So now bridge C is going to send this broadcast packet to bridge B, to bridge E, and to bridge D. And bridge B is going to send its broadcast packet to bridge C, bridge E, and bridge D. And bridge E is going to send its broadcast packet to bridge B, C, bridge C, bridge D. You get the idea. And as soon as those devices receive a broadcast packet from a different bridge, say when bridge C now receives the, broadcast, the same broadcast packet from bridge E, bridge C says, oh, I need to send this to everybody else. So it sends it to bridge B, bridge A, bridge D, who then send it to bridge B, bridge E, bridge D. So that broadcast packet is going to loop forever. And our network can only handle so much traffic. So what we have now going on is a, a it's just going to increase incre and increase forever the amount of traffic on our network because this data is never going to stop anywhere. And this is going to cause a, an issue, this is going to cause a complete denial of service on our network because there's going to be so much traffic from our bridges saying, oh, here's a broadcast packet, here's a broadcast packet, and just pushing these packets everywhere that we're not going to be able to get anything done on our network. So we need a way to prevent this. We need some sort of protocol that says, okay, if you receive this packet and you're going to start sending this packet to everybody, there needs to be some blocks in place to make sure that you don't receive this packet again and then go and send it out to everybody again and receive it again and send it out to everybody again. We need a way to prevent these loops. So let's erase our broadcast packets here. And this way that we prevent this is called spanning tree protocol. So spanning tree protocol prevents loops by it turns certain links to blocking mode. Now, let's take a look at that. So what happens with spanning tree protocol? Well, spanning tree protocol essentially sends out a packet that lets 
our spanning tree protocol know, OK, hey, I'm going to send out this test packet. And B receives the packet and sends it to E, C, and D, who all want to send it back to everywhere else, who want to send it back to me and wants to send it back to B and wants to send it back to E. And so this packet determines that, OK, we have a lot of loops going on here. Now, we wouldn't set up our bridges necessarily in a complete total mesh topology, but just in our hypothetical situation, um, we have. So what our spanning tree protocol is going to do is it's going to determine, OK, I'm going to set some of these links in blocking mode, which means these links are not going to send, we're not going to send any data on these links. So bridge A is going to maintain all of its links. So it's going to be able to send to everybody. Bridge C, in order to help prevent loops, is going to block off its link to B, and it's going to block off its link to E, and it's going to block off its link to D. So bridge C, if it needs to communicate to bridge D, needs to go through bridge A. So if bridge A sends a broadcast packet to bridge C, it's going to stop there. Bridge C isn't going to propagate that broadcast packet to everybody because our spanning tree protocol knows, OK, if bridge A gets a packet and sends it out broadcast, everybody's already going to get it. I don't need to send this on to anybody else. So bridge C, we're eliminating our links here between bridge C, bridge, uh, between bridge C and B and E and D. So bridge A can still send to everybody. But we also need to eliminate our links between bridge E and bridge A, as well as bridge D and bridge A. Because if A sent a packet to B who sent it to E, they could send it back to A. And we would have an ABE loop going on. Or if A sent a packet to B who sent it to D, they could send it back to A. And we would have an ABD loop going on. So now A can send to B, and B can send to E. And that's where our broadcast packet would stop. E isn't going to send it on to anybody else. A could send to B, and B could send to D, and then it wouldn't go anywhere else because D isn't going to forward that packet on to anybody else. Because if it receives it from B, then it's going to say, OK, I'm not going to send this broadcast back, back where it came from. And there's nowhere else where I can, there's no other links that I have to any other devices other than B to D. So I'm just going to hold on to this broadcast packet. And then we just have our link between A and C. So we have these different links in blocking mode. And this has now prevented our loops. And I'm trying to look over this. I keep looking back at this just to make sure I don't have any other uh, hidden loops going on that I haven't identified. But um, you, get, you get the gist. We're essentially trying to block links to block off loops. Now. The upside of this is we've prevented loops. We've prevented our network from going down because of loops. The downside of this is our most direct path to certain parts of our network now may not be available. So if A needs to send a packet all the way over to D, A can no longer send directly to D because of our loops. If we, if we allowed A to send directly to D, then we have the potential for an ADB loop. So we blocked off that link. But A has to send to B, who then sends to D. So we're eliminating some of our most direct paths. And this is a downside, and this may cause a little bit of slowness, but it's better than our network going down. We also may have the, uh, another upside, where when devices go offline, Others remove their blocks. So what do we mean by this? Well, let's say uh, someone, someone disgruntled goes into our network closet and uh, takes a tire iron and puts a hole in bridge B. So bridge B probably isn't going to be sending any packets right now. So does that mean that we can't talk between bridge A, bridge E, and bridge D? No. When our spanning tree protocol realizes that, oh, I just tried to send a packet to D, 
and to I just tried to send a packet to E or D and I can't get there can I send a packet to B no B is offline so I'm gonna remove some of my blocks in order to make my network start working again so as soon as B goes offline a might remove its block between A and E. And then E removes its block between E and D. Oh, not, not C and D, but between E and D. There we go. So now, even with B offline, because we had our mesh topology here now unblocked, A can get to E directly, and A can get to E who can get to D. But D can still not can still cannot get back to A directly because we would have an A E D loop. So that's how spanning tree protocol works in a nutshell. Our bridges, because they connect different network segments, they could cause cause blank during broadcast. They can cause loops during broadcast. Um, spanning tree protocol helps prevent these loops. They turn off, uh, they turn certain links into blocking mode, and that blocking mode means that they're, they're not going to send, they're not going to send traffic on that link. The most direct path may not be used. That's our downside of spanning tree protocol. We may not have a direct path between A and D. We have to go a couple other steps in order to get there. But the good side of that is that we're not, we're not causing any loops. And then our last point, our last upside, is that when certain devices go offline, like we had someone put a tire iron through bridge B, we were still able to simply have those blocks removed using spanning tree protocol, which automatically determined that I need to remove these blocks in order for my network to continue functioning without bridge B. We're now able to communicate between all of our other network components still. And again, this, is also, this also is determined by um, if you're able to communicate with all your other network components based on what type of topology that you have. If you don't have a complete mesh topology, say, uh, say for example, I never wired a direct link between A to E or E to D or E to anybody else for that matter. If my network topology is such that I can only get to E through B, then I'm not going to be able to get through E just because I have spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree protocol and these devices coming back off online, um, either, even after others are offline, um, still has the limitations of physical connections between devices. So we have to realize that. That's our spanning tree protocol, and that's how we keep bridges from forming loops. And so hopefully we'll be able to utilize that, and we'll be able to uh, prevent that crosstalk, and we'll be able to prevent those uh, broadcast storms on our network.